Have you ever watched such an incredible and odd piece of creative work that just can't find its way out of your head? So instead of fighting that hostile takeover, you decide to follow it down this weird rabbit hole and see what you might find on the other side. Well, that was Hosier's De Selby for me. Hozier has got to be one of my favorite musical artists, and he had recently come out with a studio album. And the piece opens up with two tracks named DeSelby, parts one and two. DeSelby is a fictional character referred to in The Third Policeman, a novel by Flan O'Brien. He is a lunatic, mad scientist, philosopher kind of character, and he has some of the most insane theories on how the basic functions of the world work as well as just a general way of living life. And the music's lyrics use the imagery of DeSelby's theories, his theory of, for instance, night not being a lack of sunlight when the sun goes away, but instead the sky filling with black air that comes from volcanoes around the world. Very kooky guy. Doing a little bit of digging around the music, I grew really curious about this strange philosopher character. What did he have to do in influencing the narrator of The Third Policeman, and why does Domino Gleason have a shovel? So the third policeman, it begins with the telling of a murder committed by our narrator. We never figure out his name, we'll just call him Flan. The book opens up. Not everybody knows how I killed old Philip Mathers, smashing his jaw in with my spade. But first it is better to speak of my friendship with John Divney, because it was he who first knocked old Mathers down by giving him a great blow in the neck with a special bicycle pump. Divney was a strong civil man, but he was lazy and idle-minded. He was personally responsible for the whole idea in the first place. It was he who told me to bring my spade. Flan then tells the tale of his entire life, as well as the beginnings of his obsession with the works of the philosopher De Selby. And Flan was obsessed with reading these works. He even wrote his own works. He believed to have written the final word about De Selby's career. The problem was he didn't have enough money to publish his work. Divney, knowing this, convinces our narrator to join his plot to rob old Philip Mathers, a wealthy farmer who always carries this black box of money with him. The plan is botched and Divney strikes the old man and orders our narrator to strike the death blow with his spade. And while our narrator is distracted, Divney takes the black box and runs with it, only to return having hidden away the cash box. He refuses to tell him where he had hid the box of money because it wasn't safe enough yet. After many months, or was it years? I think it was three years in the book. Finally, Divney says that they are safe to retrieve the reward. But Divney uses this as a ploy to kill our narrator and gets away with it. We don't know that Flan the narrator is killed until the very end. And the way that his death is described, is I just absolutely love it. It was as if the daylight had changed with unnatural suddenness, as if the temperature of the evening had altered greatly in an instant, or as if the air had become twice as rare or twice as dense as it had been in the winking of an eye. Perhaps all of these and other things happened together, for all my senses were bewildered all at once and could give me no explanation. Now, in the afterlife, this is where the strangest things begin to happen to our main character. He meets and speaks with Old Mathers, the man that he had killed. He then wanders into a strange land looking for a police barrack where he encounters two of three very odd policemen that work there. The policemen record data and levels that we don't know much about in the beginning. They have an obsession with bicycles. The officers are just completely clueless. I mean, why would they even be cops in the first place? Policeman McCriskin's unworldly contraptions and builds, and the policeman's further obsession with bicycles. It gets infinitely weirder, including a character's relationships with a bicycle as a person. Just a lot of odd shit. I find absurdity very fascinating. There's a book by Albert Camus called The Myth of Sisyphus. It deals with the great question of suicide. When we discover that the world and existence is completely absurd, what do we do? He ultimately concludes to embrace the absurdity of things. Accepting absurdity means that we give up trying to find meaning and simply lean into living presently. And parts of me kind of feels that the character of the Selby, this weird philosopher dude, embodies some of that. Maybe not consciously. I don't, I'm don't. i not saying that Flan O'Brien made this a conscious effort and he read Albert Camus's idea. I'm not saying any of that. Like this Selby, we can lean into the absurd, entertain it, 
and just make some fun out of it if there's anything to be made of from this absurdity. And I like to think of this version of hell that O'Brien writes in this book to be a bit reflective of the personal hells that we encounter in our lives. When everything just loses meaning, when everything stops to make sense to you, it all just appears so ridiculous. As unearthly and strange and alien as the story can sometimes feel, there have been points in my life that I've been in the strangest scenario encountering the strangest people that I never could have thought existed. And I would always struggle to try and make sense of these people, where they come from, how they become like they are, how they find themselves in a scenario, how I found myself in a scenario like the one that I found myself in. But ultimately just accepting that I was there and accepting the absurdity and ridiculousness of the people that I was around gave me enough peace of mind to navigate through that hell and eventually climb out of it. At the end of the book, when Flan finally makes it back home, it's been clear that it wasn't just a couple of days that had passed, but decades. He finds Divni in their old home with now a wife and children and significantly aged, discovering that he has appeared to Divni as a ghost that no one but him can see. Divni then dies of shock, probably a heart attack, and joins him in this new weird afterlife. They go off onto the journey into the strange land to the police barracks, having forgotten everything, their memories completely erased of the events that had happened throughout this book, and enter the police barracks, and the police officers ask them the same question that they had asked Flan in the beginning. Is it about a bicycle? The story begins once again, having been in a loop for decades and continuing to go on in that loop for the rest of eternity. I've always found the idea of eternal recurrence, this idea that life has happened infinitely before and will continue to happen infinitely there again. I've always found that really fascinating. It's one of Nietzsche's bigger ideas that he wrote about a thought experiment, if you will, believing that life can only be good if you are presented with the opportunity to live it again and again and again and again and again, and you would gladly take the opportunity. It's something that I've thought about for a long time and it's a way that I've kind of, it's a way of thinking that has sort of found its way to be a really central part of how I see the world. Maybe not that life happens again and again and again, meta, you know, in this metaphysical way, but more in that certain patterns of how life ebbs and flows constantly come and go. The personal hells that we encounter in our life will go away and good times will return again. They always do, but that hell will come back as well. And those good times will leave and those terrible times will leave once again for the good times to return. And it will be that for all of existence. Nothing will last forever and they will go on to the next and these good and bad times will cycle until you die. It's one of those things that just kind of helps me navigate the complexity and strangeness of life and it's a little bit of why it helps me make sense of it all i guess the big questions you know which is a bit contradictory to um uh the whole absurdity idea of not trying to make sense of it <laughs> but it's something that i've thought more about after i've read the third policeman if you had to do it again and again and again and again endlessly would that be punishment for the life that you had led, the actions that you've taken, or will it be a reward? Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.